Welcome, everyone, to Sundays with Jane Eyre. This is episode seven, No Thorns But Strange Laughter at Thornfield. We'll be covering chapter 11 of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre today. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, and joining me today as co-host is author Fanula Austin. Welcome, Fanula. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here and hanging out with all these fellow airheads. Yes, we are. Bronte sores and airheads. Um, that is er erudite Bronte sores and airheads as, as uh, how I have been, uh, how, how the audience christened themselves. And I, I am happy to go along with that. Um, I want to talk to you about your about Bronte's mistress and your Jane Eyre story and, and all that stuff before we get into the book today. But first, I want to welcome all our erudite Bronte sores and airheads. Uh, if you're new to the show today, welcome. Thanks for watching it. Uh, I hope you watch all the past shows too. Uh, just a note on our format, if you're watching live on Zoom, the chat for you guys is to talk to each other while we do this on Zoom. But if you have a question for Fanula or myself today during the show, put it in the Q&A box and we will get to them. Um, we're also streaming live on YouTube. And I encourage everyone to watch the stream on YouTube, or even if you watch it live on Zoom, go on YouTube, like it, subscribe, comment, do all that stuff that help us raise the profile of the show would be really great. Fanula Austin, everyone, was born in Gravesend in England. She was raised in Ireland. The BA, she got a BA in classics and English from Merton College, Oxford followed by a master's in English literature and Victorian literature from Corpus Christi College. I'm very um, uh, envious. Uh, she founded The Secret Victorianist, which is a, an award-winning blog dedicated to 19th century literature and culture. And her first novel, Bronte's Mistress, was released, oh, there it is, was released by Atria Books in August, 2020. It is now out in paperback. Finula. Yes. Welcome. Um, this, oh, and everybody today, we are going to give away, uh, a copy of a signed copy of this novel, uh, to you. And at the end of the show, I'll do some kind of random pick in the participants. So don't leave early if you want a chance at winning uh, a signed copy of it. And, uh, also if you order this book from a novel idea, um, are they going to get some signed book plates? Is that what we? Yeah, I, I just mailed them over. So it's been so tough to sign books in person, obviously with the pandemic. So me and a lot of other writers, we've been sending signed book plates. So they're branded Bronte's Mistress. I signed them, sent them off to Philly and just a great way for people to be buying from local stores versus going to big online retailers, which will remain nameless. Very local for Philadelphia. Novel idea on Pashunk. It's on Pashunk Ave in South Philadelphia. Uh, and if you order from them online, you can get a signed book plate for your copy as well. Um, Fanua, oh my God, I feel like there's a, there's a gazillion things uh, we could start with. But um, your background first in, I mean, you studied this as well as, you know, writing fiction and, and maintaining a blog. How did you... How did, how did you get on that path for 19th century literature? Yeah, so I think Jane Eyre was probably one of the first 19th century novels that I ever read. And actually it was first read to me. Um, this was not the copy that was read to me. It would have been my mother's copy. Uh, I don't know exactly what age I was. I, I would estimate around eight, so pretty young. And I think my mother did a great job of stretching us. So reading books to us that we weren't yet able to read ourselves. Um, but by the time I was 9, 10, 11, I was just devouring Victorian novels all by myself. I, I read all of the Bronte's novels. I read a lot of Dickens. Um, in my teens, I did a lot of Thomas Hardy, Wilkie Collins, Mary Elizabeth Braddon, George Eliot. And I really found that the 19th century was just my period. I, I loved reading about it. I felt super familiar with it. And I was reading everything from historicals being written in the 20th century, historical romance, Georgette Hare, um, to these big doorstopper books themselves. Um, so, and I think for me, what attracted me to it was one, the 19th century is just foreign enough. Um, it's different. I, you have to understand a different time period. Yeah, 
but it's not so different that we don't understand where people are coming from. Um, yeah, the, pa- the past our- is a foreign country, but there's still people there. You understand people. Right, exactly. And it's not like when you go back to the Tudor period, read Shakespeare plays, it's a very different world versus the concerns of the 19th century from um, class, inequality, wealth mm-hmm. divide, all very pertinent now. The industrial revolution, we could say we're going through another digital revolution now. So I found it oddly familiar, even while it was stretching me in a different direction. Um, So then I went to Oxford, studied classics and English. I was reading a lot of Latin literature um, as well as English, but the 19th century was always my happy place. And I came back to, I would say the kind of trashier 19th century novels, the sensation fiction, for fun throughout that period. And so when I did my master's, that's what I focused on. I I did actually do one essay on Charlotte Bronte as as part of my um, master's. I I wrote about student teacher relationships um, in the work of Charlotte Bronte, romantic, um, but also not romantic, like we see with Jane and Adele here. And then my dissertation was focused on Wilkie Collins and Mary Elizabeth Braddon. So looking at um, the femme fatale sort of figure in those books, the Lady Audley from Lady Audley's Secret, um, these women who come into the perfect domestic middle-class home and disrupt it from within. Um, So yeah, I've been a 19th centuryist, I guess, ever since childhood. And even when I left academia, I, I have a day job in digital advertising. I kept up my blog, The Secret Victorianist, to share my love of it. And of course, now I'm a published novelist myself and my novel, Bronte's Mistress, is set in the 1840s and deals directly with a scandalous incident in the lives of the Bronte family. Like a, like a true Victorian person, too, you have a backing in the classics. That's your education. So, you know. Um, yes, I always felt that gave me a kind of link. And then also there's the context of growing up in Northern Ireland there's a lot of discussion of religion, right? So some of these nuances about Catholicism versus Protestantism, um, I think we see a little dash of this in this chapter we're going to talk about today. A little bit, yeah. But of course, more in Villette um, was very familiar. So I felt like I had kind of drank from the same well as a lot of the writers that I was reading in this period. How did your blog uh, come about, Secret Victorianist? So I left academia after my master's. I was never intending to get a PhD. I wanted to join a corporate world. And I had a job back then in PR that changed into advertising. I now work at Meta, formerly Facebook, so social media side. Um, But I didn't want this part of my life to be dead. It was so important to me and had been so important to me. Um, And let me just just remind everybody, see English majors, their jobs for you. English majors are extraordinarily hireable. Got it. Um, Yes. And so I I also accessibility was important to me. So I thought, could I break some of my quite esoteric essays into blog posts that would be digestible, that you didn't need to have a master's from Oxford or elsewhere to understand. So I really took a lot of the material initially from my academic work and broke them up into snackable blog posts. Since then, it's evolved over time. So I write a lot more now about books being written in the 21st century, but set in the 19th. Um, I have less time to do close reading. I I used to do a lot of close reading, especially of Victorian poetry. Um, But if I go to an art exhibition featuring a painter from the 19th century or a play with a 19th century link, I I write about that too. And of course, now I also share some information over there about my writing journey. So I think there's there's some blog posts that are great for fellow writers. um, And a lot of the material on there is really for people who love the 19th century. What year did you start that blog? 2013. 2013. Um, yeah. Because, just as you know, my workforce. Yeah. When I, when I discovered you last year with your book, I had, I had, then I had gone and like, Ooh, secret Victoria. That sounds cool. And I went to the blog and I actually found it. It was like liked in, it was in my favorites from years ago. Like I had, I had <laughs> once been visiting it um, uh, and then had not made the connection. And so I was glad to get back to it. Yeah. I mean, initially that's why it was called the secret Victorianist was because my name wasn't attached to it. Um, So it was kind of my weird double identity. If you go back to those posts from 2013, you'll see that I never showed my face. So I would often be holding up a program or my back would be shown. And I thought it would be kind of embarrassing as someone with a fledgling career in marketing if I had a blog with all of 10 followers or whatever it was at the beginning. (laughs) Um, But now the identities are merged. And I I see someone just asked in the chat where they can find it. It's secretvictorianist.com. And I guess the other part of the joke was not Victoria's Secret, the underwear store, but Secret Victorianist. Yeah. 
So you're doing the blog. Had Bronte's Mistress as a novel been kind of long in gestation? Is this something you had thought about or did it, how, how, did, how, did, how did the novel come about? And well, and then first of all, let people know what the novel is about. Yes. Um, so to answer the first bit of the question first, no, Bronte's Mistress was not an idea I'd had for years, but I had always wanted to be a writer. Um, from before I could even write. Um, my mother will tell you I was making books out of pieces of paper, drawing pictures with crayons and getting her to add the words. Uh -huh. I, I spent a lot of my childhood writing, whether it was plays for my Barbies to perform, angsty poetry as a kind of miserable 11, 12 year old, um, YA fantasy trilogy that I was writing from age 12 to 18 and of course never finished. Um, but this particular idea didn't come till later. So I wrote my first full length novel as an adult in my early 20s. Um, it was a 19th century setting and that was born out of trying to write my own sensation novels. So very influenced by Braddon and Collins saying, how could I create the most ridiculous plot of all time um, mm -hmm. with all of the tropes of sensation fiction? So people who are relatives, but don't know it, bigamy, murder, secret passageways, all in there. Um, started as a kind of experiment for myself, took me four and a half, five years, because that did coincide with the start of my career. Um, and then when I tried to find an agent to try and get it published, um, what I heard from people was, this is too Victorian, um, it's not in line <laughs> with current taste. Um, your character is a bit of a misogynist. And I was like, well, that's the point. A lot of these main characters, like think of Lady Audley's Secret again, like mm -hmm. are misogynistic. Um, and I think, it was funny for those who knew Victorian literature as well as I did, but maybe a little niche. Um, so thankfully I had heeded advice that I should start working on another project while I waited to hear back from literary agents. Um, I was dabbling with a few other ideas. And, and then I actually read um, for the first time, Elizabeth Gaskell's Life of Charlotte Bronte. I, I'd read many other Bronte biographies. I read sections of the Gaskell biography and heard it quoted but I'd never read it cover to cover. Uh, and in Mrs. Gaskell's Life of Charlotte Bronte, which she wrote just after Charlotte's death, I, I came across the passages where she spoke about Lydia Robinson, um, who was the wife of Branwell and Anne Bronte's employer. So Branwell acted as um, tutor to her son, while the youngest Bronte sibling, Anne, um, was governess um, to the three surviving daughters. And what Elizabeth Gaskell says in this biography is that Mrs. Robinson was this profligate woman who tempted Branwell into the deep disgrace of a deadly crime by which she means an adulterous affair. Um, she says that unlike in the Victorian novels of the period, in this case, it was the man who became the victim and then paints a picture of after Branwell's death, Lydia Robinson, now Lady Scott, having got a title and a richer second husband, is flaunting herself in London society with no remorse for what she's done. And she even suggests that Lydia Robinson could be held responsible not only for Branwell's death, but for the deaths of Emily and Anne that followed soon afterwards uh, and really destroying the whole Bronte family. And, and as soon as I read this passage, it was so vitriolic. Um, the note, oh, very harsh. And the note section, you know, talks about the fact that Lady Scott, Lydia, um, actually threatened to sue Mrs. Gaskell. So she took back these allegations out of the next edition yeah. um, of the biography, which was a huge bestseller. Um, and so I just immediately thought, well, has anyone written a novel from Lydia Robinson's perspective, right? Like there's always two sides to every story. So I set the biography down, I Googled, and I found there's been, of course, lots of biographical works in film and on the page about the Brontes, but Lydia Robinson really hadn't been explored in her own right. She'd been a villain on the side. People had kind of accepted Mrs. Gaskell's word for it and no one had written a novel in her voice. And so I thought, I can't believe no one's done this yet um, because there's such a trend in historical fiction of mm. women's stories um, that we perhaps haven't heard about or have been mischaracterized. Um, and I, I did a full year of research, um, but when I actually wrote this novel, it, it took me six months. I wrote it incredibly quickly. I just had to get it out on the page. And with this depth of historical research, I almost felt like I had a co-writer of, I was writing it with the history that I'd uncovered. Um, yeah, you already so yeah. had that research. So that was, you know, you could, you could draw on that the whole time. Yes, and of course I had 
you know, the novels of the Brontes, including Jane Eyre, had been percolating in my brain for years um, since early childhood. Um, so, and when I got my agent and, you know, sent her the premise, I remember the reply she sent me was, who could resist the story of the woman who corrupted Branwell Bronte? And she said, this will be catnip to English majors. Which is <laughs> so yeah, there's is, that's the hardcover version. Yeah. That's the paperback, um, different covers. Um, it's around 50-50, whether people tell me they prefer one or the other, but very proud to have it out in the world. And the best thing has been bringing me closer even just over Zoom with lots of other Bronte fans. Yeah, you've had to do this book during the pandemic. This was it was released during the pandemic, wasn't it? Yeah, August 2020. A question about historical fiction. As I'm reading, as I, as I'm reading your novel, one of the things I really like about it is, and you and you mentioned that when you had written a previous novel, that was like, oh, it's too Victorian. Right. And I'm reading this, and I'm feeling your characters are very Victorian. And, and the way they think and behave. And I often encounter this in historical fiction that sometimes what I don't like in historical fiction is when the author is has, it's like modern people walking around in an old world and right. the way they think and the way they behave. I think, come on, no one's going to behave that way in you know, whatever year this historical fiction is. And I don't find you doing that here. And so good job. But also was, it, was that ever a thought especially because the first one that's criticism you got and how do you can how you can portray a different mindset and still have people identify and yeah. understand I mean, I mean for a start i totally agree with you this is one of my least favorite things when i read um historical fiction being published now and it is often a female main character who feels like a 21st century millennial right so she'll say things like why shouldn't women have the right to vote? And slavery is terrible. And I'm not, I don't want a husband telling me what I want to do. And of course, um, that's true that there were some people in the 19th century who held some of those views, right? There were people lobbying for the abolition of slavery. There were women who were starting to raise their voices and ask for equal rights in terms of voting and property and education. Um, there were certainly women who chose unconventional paths, like think of George Eliot living with a man who was not her husband. But for me, it's collecting all of those views into the same person is when it makes it less realistic. So I would prefer, well, let's have a character who's a suffragette lobbying for the vote, but perhaps she has blind spots when it comes to issues of race or colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like the idea of people being complex and I, I don't like it when we have one character who's clearly on the right side of the history or conversely, a, a character who's on the wrong side of history. I think about the play and Inspector Calls where we're meant to think that one character has bad judgment because he comes out with the line, the Titanic will never sink. And us watching that now, we're like, oh, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, many people did not believe the Titanic could sink. It was an unsinkable ship, famously. Um, so I think the criticism of that first unpublished book that taught me so much was less about the characterization and more about the writing style. Um, so the heavy reliance on adverbs, um, the distance of an omniscient point of view. Um, Bronte's mistress, yes, Lydia is very much a woman of her time, um, but the first person deep access to her inner thoughts is more in vogue in writing now. What's interesting, of course, is we get the start of that in a book like Jane Eyre, which is very close, brings us into the heart um, but that is different from the kind of wide Dickensian perspective of something like the start of A Tale of Two Cities. We read now it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and we think it's a wonderful opening, but very few modern writers are writing with that kind of wide lens. Yeah. We're very interested in close third um, and first. I will say that still with the novel, um, I, I read all my reviews, good and bad. I know many writers don't. Um, there are people who find Lydia too unlikable. I think because of some of her 19th century viewpoints, um, especially how she parents is very different from uh, a 2021 American parenting style. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, this was the intention of this book. I didn't want it to be totally redeeming Lydia Robinson saying that she was an angel. I wanted to get into the heart and head of a complex 19th century woman who's flawed, selfish, makes choices that perhaps we disagree with, um, but hopefully by the end of the novel, a lot of people can understand. And so those are the reviews I enjoy and the responses where people say, 
oh, wow, I didn't always like this character, but I understood. And it made me think about how difficult the position of women was in the 19th century, even when we're talking about a woman who's privileged because she's white, she has money, she's mistress of her own home, right? She has it better than the Brontes, um, better than governesses in people's homes, um, better than the servants, certainly, but she's still under a lot of repression and restriction. Those used to be those things she got, all those privileges she has used to be an attraction for readers in a novel. And now they're kind of drawbacks. Now we're kind of like, wait a minute, I don't want to read. I've, I've read enough of that. Um, yeah, I one mean, last that, Go ahead. I was just going to say that was one thing that was important to me was that while this is Lydia's book, all of all of my characters are real. So that includes the servant characters. So mm -hmm. when you see servants say things to Lydia, like I have six children, that's because I know that that real life person who was a servant in her home was supporting a family of six. And so I think that's a modern lens of we don't want the servants to just come in carrying a tray and then exit stage mm -hmm. left. We want them to feel like fully rounded humans too, because honestly, their lives are a lot more relatable than the master and mistress of the house. That leads me in the question I'm just going to ask is how much do we know about Lydia Rob? How much did you, are you able to get from Lydia Robinson? Are there letters, records, those kinds of things, or were you really trying to just piece her, create her life from the little yeah. that was left. I don't know. There's quite a lot. Um, the Brontes are very studied. So anything where she interacts with them has been studied again and again and again, looked at to death, um, particularly the period um, surrounding Branwell's dismissal from her household and Anne's um, resignation. A lot of scholars have had different theories about exactly what went down on those particular few weeks. So I read all secondary literature on it, um, went back to primary sources as well. I came up with my own dramatic solution when I realized that the York Scarborough railway line um, opened up during that period too, which allowed the lovers to meet and connect. Is it definitely what happened? No. Is it highly possible? Also no, but it's plausible enough to make it into a dramatic mm -hmm. historical novel. Um, primary sources, things like census records, um, this amazing collection of diaries um, by a local carpenter called George Whitehead, who kept books labeled births, deaths, marriages, and sundries about the surrounding area. Um, sundries being anything from him having a cold to his horse being lamed to a local farmhand committing suicide. All of that is recorded, which really gives you the color of the countryside. And then letters, 18 letters by Lydia exist. So I was able to hold them at the Bronte Parsonage um, in the archives there, which was amazing. Um, they're business letters, so they're not very interesting in terms of content, but a few great details. So one, mm -hmm. she always signs herself yours very truly. So in the letters I wrote, she always signs herself yours very truly. Um, two, there's a little tidbit of interest um, around her saying, that her mother-in-law was angry at her for trying to dismiss one of the servants, which for me span out the whole character of her terrible monster-in-law, mother-in-law um, figure, um, and um, a subplot involving two of the household servants. And then three, the letters that exist are rimmed in black because they're um, it was during a period of mourning. Um, and that's just a, such a beautiful period detail that it wasn't yeah. just clothes that changed. It was the paper that you wrote on. Yeah. So my publisher actually for our Instagram or mailing, when we mailed books out to big bookstagram accounts, sent one of the letters from the novel on that beautiful black rimmed paper. So it, it was great to see people posting photos of that and a great idea for the marketing. Good. Yeah. I've seen lots of, I, mean, I, think, I think one of our Dickens letters at the Rose and Back is is the morning edge on it with the it's all and if anybody has ever seen one it's just all around the edges it's just black it's just a black border um and that's paper you used when you were in mourning yeah no it, it's just I, I remember going to the art of mourning exhibition at the metropolitan museum of art and seeing the clothing um it's just wonderful to see the different um gradations and what like a widow or a bereaved mother would wear compared to a more distant family member how, how far you are in mourning is marked by the gradual changing of colors. Um, that comes up in Georgette Hare a lot. People talking about being in half mourning, longing to wear brighter colors. Lydia's yeah. daughter, also Lydia, mentions that at one point in Bronte's Mistress. Um, but those are the kind of little details that are more foreign to us now, but really bring the world alive. Great. All righty. You have a favorite Victorian novel? Oh, that's really hard. I mean, usually people ask me who my favorite Bronte is, and I don't even have my answer down on that one. <laughs> I, I'm an 
older sister. I have one younger sister. So Charlotte, not that she was the oldest sister, but she ended up in that role. She became that, yeah. Yeah, I've always kind of felt sympathy with that. Um, but I've been thinking about Anne a lot. I, I recently got to write uh, an introduction for a new edition of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Oh, good. I think it's a wonderful book. Yeah. And Agnes Gray was actually in my mind as a comparison point when reading this chapter 11. Um, and then, yeah, Mary Elizabeth Braddon, obviously I did my dissertation on her. I think she is very underread. So yeah. Lady Audley Secret people talk about, but th there are many more. Um, Hostages to Fortune, for instance, is a very bizarre one that no one reads that I thought was wonderful. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for more. Um, and, and yet Mrs. Gaskell herself, right? Like I, I think a lot of people know North and South, but I do think that Gaskell's novels are, are great. Um, and then Middlemarch, of course, the what did um, Virginia Woolf say, the first novel in English written for grown up people? Yeah. So I, I know you can go on and on. Is yeah, there a contemporary, or not even contemporary, just a later writer of, of fiction set in the Victorian age that you like to make people aware of? Hmm, that's there are so many, and it's hard because once you're a writer, you hang out with lots of other writers. Yeah, you'd have to kind of excuse, like, except for all the people that I'm reading now and that I know. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I would say I think the best, this isn't Victorian, but the, the best historical novelist, I think, right now is Hilary Mantel, Uncontroversial yeah. Choice, obviously the Wolf Hall series, um, but also A Place of Greater Safety, which is her French Revolution novel. Um, so edging a little closer to my period. Um, really great. Um, I've been reading a lot of, of course, other Bronte inspired and Jane Austen inspired literature. Um, so I just like seeing how other people react to the Bronte's works. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Stewart's Ill Will taking yeah. lost years from Wolverine Heights. I know you spoke to him, I think. Yeah, Michael was on the I show a couple of weeks ago. Bronte kind of inspired things. Um, or on the um, Jane Austen side, uh, Molly Greeley, um, her The Clergyman's wife looking at what happened to charlotte collins nay lucas after her oh i don't know that one i'll have to check that out um but no i i'm reading so much um and then sarah perry um the essex serpent um was one from the last few years um mm -hmm. that i thought was just a really interesting gothic um kind of take on 19th century literature so i know that with the books you've been reading in the series frankenstein and dracula you probably have a contingent of gothic fans um, yeah. so you might enjoy the essex serpent and scholars on the show so yeah, yeah great all righty well we we're, we're gonna have to hit this chapter sooner or later we have one yeah. chapter to do today so we're okay like talking a little first and um uh but uh just a reminder everybody i will give away or or we will give away um, Finola will give away a copy of her of her novel. I'll pick someone at random uh, who is still here at the end of the show today. And also, if you want to order the book from a novel idea in, uh, on Pashyunk in Philadelphia, you can go online and, and find the novel idea. Uh, you can get a signed book plate with your order. And everyone, I'm wearing the T-shirt today. This is the, oh, I'll move the beard. This is the Sundays with Jane Eyre T-shirt. I think some people have received theirs um, well, which is nice. Uh, the, some people have received their mugs. Everything takes so long to get out now um, with all the kind of different, you know, delays and in, in shipping. Um, but uh, um, uh, I thought I'd wear the shirt today. I'm feeling, I feel so under, like I don't have a vest on. I usually like, I'm very tweeted up and today I had to wear a t-shirt. So, um, but I didn't have to, like clearly <laughs> I'd like to, this is a great shirt. Um, but I'll mention, uh, these a little later in the uh, uh at our at our at our mid break are you drinking anything today finola i'm afraid just water for me but i know you have a drink inspired by the chapter right i do i'm drinking negus uh, or negus um uh which um is a uh victoria and it's mentioned in this chapter and it's and it's basically everyone it's it's port or sherry i i prefer port with hot boiling water in it and um, sugar, spices, however you do. I cheat because I actually mull the port with some allspice <clears throat> uh, in it first and then add boiling water to that. And I also put in a little sugar and a little, I'm gonna, I'm gonna freshen mine up, uh, a little sugar and a little uh, lemon zest I, put, I like to put in it. And then I'll pour some hot water in. 
And if you ever see pictures of this or the way they do it, it's often, it's often, you know, a lot clearer than I do. I'm a lot heavier on the port. Um, yeah, a little warm mold port in there. I put a lemon wedge in it too. So cheers. Cheers. I won't cheers with water, but I'll wait. I, I actually have a, a relevant port anecdote, um, especially because the clocks changed um, here in the U.S. last night. So you mentioned my Oxford College undergraduate was Merton. Uh, Merton College has a ridiculous tradition since the 1970s, where on the night the clocks go back, people walk backwards around the main quadrangle in full <laughs> academic regalia, drinking port and cheersing to Merton to keep the oh my space. God. Time, you know, I would do battle. that in a heartbeat. <laughs> uh, I, I think you'd be a fan. It, it's, uh, it's also a good fun. <laughs> That's fun. Very warming, very soothing. It's a, it's a great fall winter drink. So, and, and very much dry. And, you know, I, I know from Dickens novels and I used to have drinking with Dickens programs <coughs> where we would have uh, these Dickens punch and Victorian inspired drinks and, we would always have Negus and we're going to have one in uh, December uh, at the Rosenbach drinking with Dickens and uh, yes, we'll have Dickens an punch there. What's that? An interesting um, Victorian drinking thing I saw on Twitter the other day is someone mentioned a, a novel that said people were ordering a pint of champagne and they said, oh, did people really do that? Did they order it by the pint glass? Um, of course, what they meant is a pint sized bottle was what they'd order for the table and then drink glasses. But I love that idea of uh, a whole pint glass of champagne. Seems like something to try out. And champagne was the, that was the regular people's drink uh, oh, yeah. in, in the 19th century. That's what, you know, that's, that's, that's what, you know, the, the, the regular folks ordered it. But now it has this reputation of being very fancy, only very special occasions. And obviously if it's pricey, you know, it, 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 can, it can be prohibitive for people. But champagne was the drink for the common people. In right, it's like century. Samuel Pepys used to feed his cat on oysters because they were the cheapest way for him to feed his cat. That yeah. cat now would think was incredibly pampered. <laughs> well, before we start with the uh, with the chapter today, we have a question from Adam, uh, which he mentioned in the chat last week, and then and then and then he sent me a more expanded version of it, and 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 I find it interesting. He says, "Imagine an alternate version of Jane Eyre. It's exactly the same, except the entire book ends at." the end of chapter 10 when she's done, like last week, uh, the last show when we're end, and, you know, and she's going to go off to um, uh, Millcote and, and Thornfield. And he says, what would you think of such a book? Um, it would be more of a novella. Um, he says, many of Bronte's contemporary critics preferred the childhood segment to the Thornfield segment. Um, and probably some modern readers do as well, himself included. I just think it would be amazing and a bold move to leave just leave Jane at that moment when she is transitioning to adulthood and independence. And then finally is the Thornfield segment and the romance and the, and the ending necessary for it to be a great novel. What if the novel ended at the 10th chapter and it's, and then obviously, but then, you know, you'd have to elaborate more on their life, but um, what do you think of the opening 10 chapters of this novel as a kind of contained unit or, yeah. and, and, and is it a novel yet? And I guess then like, what are we calling a novel? But I, I think for me, certainly the childhood chapters are among the most compelling. When you think about the novel, the standout moments, um, the red room, um, her standing on the chair and being humiliated at the school, the death of Helen, really are up there, right? I think there's a few others coming later in the book. I don't know how spoiler free we're being, but there's certainly a lot of dramatic moments coming up here. Um, but the childhood ones are very compelling. But I was kind of thinking about this in the context of the Bildung's Roman that we see in the 19th century. And mm -hmm. I think the same is true for Great Expectations, David Copperfield, a lot of people's favorite scenes are the childhood parts, but the books would feel incomplete um, without what comes next. And then I guess I would maybe take exception to the idea that she is entering adulthood right now, because I think when you become an adult is less defined. Um, and there's a lot about dependence in this novel and she enters Thornfield as a dependent. She is not a true adult. She is not moving through the world in that way because of her class position, her financial position, and the fact that she's a woman. So I would say that Jane doesn't fully enter adulthood uh, until much later here. And so the rest of it, it is necessary. Um, I certainly think that 
as well, the first part of the book is setting up a lot of ideas for later. Um, so whether that's on a linguistic level, I know you were talking about the bird imagery that comes up earlier. And of course, we'll come back in some of our most famous lines on with Rochester. So uh, we're being primed for who Jane is. Um, mm -hmm. And the childhood chapters are very important for setting up how she's going to be in this relationship um, when she comes into, um, into a relationship and meeting with Rochester. Um, so I thought it was an interesting idea, but uh, for me, I, I'm not ready to throw the latter part of the book away. Um, one thing that's happened in adaptations sometimes is that they've started with her arriving at Thornfield and then use the childhood sections as more flashback, which yeah. I actually think works very well um, for the TV and film. Yeah, medium. it works better in that, in that medium, I think so too, yeah. Yeah, in a novel that would get deeply irritating if we were always being pulled out of the main novel into backstory, like, why are we seeing this? Um, uh, tell me what's going on with Rochester. But I think on TV and film, it, it's really great because they're able to draw those parallels much more clearly mm -hmm. i feel i don't get enough in that in those early parts like, like it, it would have to be there would have to be so much more elaboration on on her time it's, i mean certainly can't skip over eight years <laughs> and then just get to that part like that's where it would have to be and then then i think we're just talking about another novel that's 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 just such a different book um but uh i i very much am noticing more this time this kind of movement in this novel that's obvious but i never really was keyed on it before the kind of gated lowwood thornfield and then um what's the other um the place with the with the rivers um yeah, yeah. Well, and then back to <laughs> and then and then it's not thornfield that it's it's the cot at the end and there's, there's a very there's very much a a discernible place in each section here as as we go on have you um, heard of the mice quotient what's that have you heard of the mice quotient no um, what's that so it's a theory for writing um mice is um an acronym it stands for milieu inquiry um character and event so a milieu story usually starts when the characters enter a place and it ends when they leave the place an inquiry story starts with a question like who murdered someone and it ends when they find the murderer the character driven story is it starts with a character question. Who is this person? Maybe they have a floor, they've got to change. And an event story is something like there's a big event like aliens have landed and taking over the world. And most novels cluster a few of these together. So a great example of this is the movie version of The Wizard of Oz. Um, it starts with a character question of Dorothy being bored in Kansas and wishing she could go somewhere else. Then there's an event with the hurricane, which allows her to enter a milieu, Oz, um, and then when she's there, there's an inquiry of we've got to find the wizard to get back. Then they find the wizard, so they close out in reverse order. So they find the wizard, but he's not the wizard who he seemed. So that inquiry thread is over. Um, then there's another event, killing the witch, the ruby slippers to get back home. That exits out the milieu. So now she's back in Kansas. And finally, she comes to the character realization that there's no place like home. So I would say that why the first 10 chapters doesn't feel like a complete book is we actually start with the character question of who Jane is and who, what is her place in this world. Then we go through the milieu of the school, we close out that, but we haven't closed out the character question and we won't until the final pages of the novel. Um, hmm. So that might be another way to think of this. That's interesting. I hadn't heard of that a mice quotient. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I don't know who first coined the phrase, but I know if anyone listens to the writing excuses podcast, they've been doing a deep dive on it recently in their oh, little, great. Uh, episodes. Awesome. Thank you. Well, let us begin this new chapter and we'll do this for a few minutes and then I'll take a little mid break for some uh, um, uh, uh, for uh, some messages. The Tracy had put a little uh, comment in our Q&A here. The National Theater production of Jane Eyre had very fun repeating trend had a very fun repeating transition scene whenever Jane moved to a new setting the actors gathered together in a group and mimed riding on a carriage while the background band played a train sounding song so um the this so Jane has has left Lowood we're at chapter 11 uh, a new chapter in a novel is something like a new scene in a play and when I draw up the curtain this time reader you must fancy you see a room in the George Inn at Millcote. 
again in this novel, which happened so many times. And then even in the second paragraph, we get two readers in, in two paragraphs here um, uh, with, with, with Jane addressing the readership. Um, we had some nice talk about that on one of the other programs, how it kind of really uh, establishes a relationship with the reader and also empowers the reader to kind of participate in a kind of way that you are included in this narrative. Yeah, I would say that's another thing that's hard to pull off nowadays, though. Um, there are some people doing the second person, some people addressing the reader directly, but it is less common. And what I've heard on the negative side is it makes people feel like you're pointing at them in a way that they're like, I want to lose myself in a book. I want to forget yeah. who I am and go into another world. Well, not for the Brontes. They want to bring you into it and put you right in this scene. Uh, she's uh, uh, if some of you may have a uh, a version where it says I left Low Lowton at four o'clock a uh, p.m. and it's actually a.m. and that's actually a typo that's corrected in later editions um, and arrives just striking eight and because well, she says it was sixteen hours exposure uh, to the rawness of an October day that's a long carriage ride in the um uh in the well it's not a long for them that's a carriage ride then but that's a long ride in the cold the bane of my existence as a historical novelist not having google maps be able to give you predicted time by horseback or by carriage would be <laughs> incredibly helpful <laughs> it would be but she's 16 hours and she gets to this cozy little inn um which is nice um and then She's uh, she says uh, she's alone in the world, cut adrift from every connection. And then I like this line, this sentence here, too. The charm of adventure sweetens that sensation. The glow of pride warms it. But then the throb of fear disturbs it. Um, in the last chapter, she talked about uh, actually and, and more than once in this novel, when she leaves places, she talks about this idea that she gets to go off on some Arabian Nights or Gulliver kind of adventure. She's going to another world that she's never seen. And there's a lot of promise. Um, but I think this is the first time where she's really said how that it's fearful as well. Yeah. And one other thing I notice here, I always look at when the Brontes gender things and when they don't. And if you see the start of that paragraph, she says, it is a very strange sensation to inexperienced youth to feel itself quite alone in the world. So I thought it was very interesting that she's choosing the gender neutral here, because I think she could have said for a youth to find himself and mm -hmm. characterize herself as being male by going off on this grand adventure. But what's interesting is she strips all gender out. And I, I think it's pretty powerful. Does that happen in this novel frequently? Yeah, I mean, it's just something I always look at. Um, I look especially about when animals are gendered, um, when they call them it and when they call them he and she. Um, I, I think that's an interesting thing like when you think about the scenes of animal cruelty in the novels of Anne and Emily, for instance, when are they kind of calling the animal an it and taking away its personality versus when are they giving it more human traits where they often gender it. And, and so that's something I do when I write 19th century as well as especially with animal metaphors, I default to the male, mm -hmm. because I think that's an old fashioned thing to do is like, when you're talking about a child or, you know, the kind of use of man to mean person, I gender it as male. It's very deliberate whenever you um, mm -hmm. call something out as female and here to go with youth itself, I, I think is a deliberate choice. I find people are, are, are often um, uh, uh, kind of surprised or shocked a little bit at, at how many times babies are called it in yeah. older fiction or older writings. And and that transition even of a human doesn't get, people don't qualify it as actually one gender or human even un, until, you know, much later it's regularly done so. Right. And they call the baby in a lot of 19th century novels, just baby, sometimes with a capital B. So sometimes the baby's been in existence 50, 100 pages before you learn what they called it. And of course, if you look at birth records versus baptism records, sometimes there was a delay of months. It was almost like they were waiting to see if baby was going to stick before they used the name. Yeah. And the baby, and, and it's not really named until the baptism. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what, everybody, uh, briefly, we've been talking so much. Uh, let me tell you all in my little mid break that we bring you Sundays to Jane Eyre for free. So if you'd like to support the Rosenbach through donation, you can do so at our website. 
Uh, and since this novel was published in 1847, we're asking for donations of $18.47 to support the show. And I'd like to thank those of you who have made a donation of 1847 or any amount, because some of you just donated any amount. And that's Gina A. in Ackworth, Georgia, Derek R. in Lancaster, PA, Barbara Z. in Reston, Virginia, uh, Sergi in S. in Dresher, PA, Norca S. in Philly, and Daryl M. in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Thank you all for your donations. But you can also become a member of the Rosenbach. Members of the Rosenbach get free and exclusive access to some programs, 10% off reading courses, 50% off of any of our Rosenbach paid programs. Uh, we have lots of great programs and courses coming up, including a couple courses coming up. I'm actually teaching a course on Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula, which is in our collection. And we're, the, the, the focus of that course is going to be, we're literally going to read the notes and talk about how they relate to the novel and Stoker putting it together and just focus on the notes for three meetings. And that starts in a couple of weeks. And we have a great course starting in just a week called The Lives of Early American Women, Revolutionary Women with Kalayla Williams. And this is a look at uh, letters and, and, and personal diaries and also historical fiction of women in the 18th and early 19th century. It's part one of a course. And then you could sign up for the second part next year, which will be Victorian uh, women. Um, but uh, that starts this Saturday and there's still some spots in it. And I'd highly recommend Lives of Early American Women. You can find that at the Rose at Rosenbeck.org at our website and register there. Uh, and if you're a member, you get 10% off of that course. Uh, and we have a bunch of new memberships among our Airhead audience. I want to thank Joanna L. from Ardmore, PA, Linda K. and Danielle C., both from Philadelphia, uh, Nicole T.W. from Paoli. Thank you, Nicole. And Niels P. from Koj, Denmark. So I know Niels and his wife, um, whose name I'm forgetting. Sorry, Niels, uh, are regular watchers of all our shows. And thank you guys so much for your membership. You join, become a member of the Rosenbach and you don't even live in Philadelphia, which, I, which I'm which i so grateful for. Um, we have brand new Sundays with Jane Air merchandise, mugs, t-shirts. People are starting to get them. Um, here's my t-shirt today. And if you have a uh, t-shirt or a mug and you want to share a picture on social media, tag the Rosenbach, tag it with Sundays with Jane Eyre. That would be really great. I love to see them and we love to put them up as well. Here's a, here's a, here's a great shot of a couple people in California wearing our t-shirts. Yes. Then that is my daughters. That's Lulu and Sophie and uh, who uh, make the credits for this show. So there they are with their Sundays with Jane Eyre out in California. Sophie's going to school there. Lulu's just visiting. Um, and what else do I have to say on today's mid break? I just wanted to remind everybody, well, the, our official bookseller, Novel ID on Pashunk, you can get editions of Jane Eyre. You can get Bronte's Mistress there, order it online and get a book plate. And also uh, the upcoming guests, uh, our upcoming co-hosts on the show, uh, next week, the Ghoul Guides, Dr. Lauren Nixon and Mary Going will return. Um, on uh, November 21st, we'll have Deborah Lutz, who is the author of The Bronte Cabinet, a great book about the Brontes looking at objects in their lives and how it, you know, uh, and how it illustrates their biographies. Um, and she's also the editor of the new Norton Critical Edition of Jane Eyre on the 28th. After Thanksgiving, we have Dr. Hannah Moss from the University of Sheffield, one of our Gothic friends who did her master's dissertation on Elizabeth Gaskell's Charlotte Bronte, Life of Charlotte Bronte. And then on December 5th, um, we have uh, Lucasta Miller, author of The Bronte Myth, returning to talk about a chapter with us. So let us return to the book. There's so much exciting stuff happening on this show. I'm so excited. So, um, Jane is, um, uh, this is fascinating. And, and somebody mentioned on our Facebook group, the use of the word amiable and the use of the word agreeable in this novel. And I, and I, and I, and I find this fascinating because when we did, you know, when we did, Fra we did Dracula and Frankenstein, there were words that kept jumping out at us because they're just used all the time. And author, sometimes this happened. Maybe you, maybe there's a word that you recognize that you, you wind up using in certain situations. And um, Frankenstein was wretched. 
um there was wretch and wretched was all over that like like crazy all over like like yeah. an editor definitely would have said yeah you have to take out some of those i mean um, the thing is though like i guess it's interesting right because now we can spot those so much more easily right yeah. like i can if i see myself use the word twice i can search the whole book very easily find replace pull them up be like there you go too many agreeables they didn't have that like i just mm -hmm. think about the labor of writing longhand yeah. how difficult it was to do corrections and how from that different kind of drafting process, we're probably getting a very different result, um, which is so fascinating to me. <laughs> the use of this word here, she says, uh, I will do my best. Um, uh, well, she says, if she is, she's talking about her new um, patron, she, Mrs. Fairfax, who she thinks is the owner of this house. I will, uh, if she is any, in any degree amiable, I shall surely be able to get on with her. Um, and uh, a little later, we have agreeable, and, and we'll hit that then. But I'm fascinated by the, well, first of all, it's actually only five amiables in the novel, because we can look that up now, and one unamiable. But the use of that word is, it's, it's, it's almost a Victorian word. Very, it's, it's not, people don't, especially in conversation, you don't hear amiable very much anymore. Right. And agreeable tends to really, the usage these days tends to be really just that, you know, uh, whether or not you agree or consent to what something's being said, but um, they had much more, you know, nuanced meetings um, uh, in, uh, for, for Charlotte Bronte and amiable, especially as it's mostly now used for just friendly. Um, you know, the actual definition is worthy of being loved, lovable. Right. It's from Amare. Well, you know, I'm talking to a classical scholar. The, the Latin Amare, you know, Amo Amas Amat, um, that's this root of this word. And it's defined that way in the OED. And you find lots of early instances where that's what is meant, not just friendly, but. Yeah, she's looking for someone to love, mm -hmm. right? Like her existence has been a lonely one. She's lost Helen. And now she thinks, well, Mrs. Fairfax, perhaps she's somebody I could love. Um, and that's a lot of, that's a high bar and a lot to go into what's essentially a job looking for. Yeah. It's like that she's not just looking for a decent position and a decent salary and getting away. She's looking for something more. And there's a few times here where I think people disappoint her, like mm -hmm. particularly later when she asks Mrs. Fairfax to sketch um, Rochester's character for her and she gives her quite bland responses. She's looking for more. And there's a few times I think that Jane's youthfulness, this idea of is she an adult yet comes through. For instance, when she actively tells Mrs. Fairfax, oh, I thought you owned um, Thornfield. Like she doesn't have to make that confession. She could easily kind of button up and swallow her in embarrassment and be glad that she'd corrected her mistake. But instead there's a kind of youthful naivety here to her that I think mm -hmm. we're meant to recognize, um, which is funny because naivete is something that she accuses Adele of later. Um, but I think we're meant to see some of it in her. And I do think that this is where we get into with Charlotte, the distance between Charlotte and Jane. Like there is obviously a lot of similarity, a lot of biographical detail in this book, but I think we're meant to have a little bit of difference distance here that when we're seeing Jane's thoughts in the carriage, we know that they're not entirely reasonable or we see some of her own youthful traumas coming in here in terms of her wants and wishes for this woman. And it's almost like she wants something gothic and bad to happen, right? Like she wants the driver to tell to her about Thornfield, but they don't tell her much. She mm -hmm. asks at the inn about Thornfield, but they don't give her any information. She sees the rooms of the house, but her own room is modern and comfortable and she mm -hmm. sleeps very well for the night. Um, none of the big dramatic um, gothic tropes happen here. Um, of course, we know that they are going to happen later, but it's almost like um, Catherine in Northanger Abbey kind of looking for the adventure here and she doesn't get yeah. it this night. She also says and in, in, in the same uh, paragraph, I will do my best. And it is a pity that doing one's best does not always answer. Uh, <laughs> and then she talks about Mrs. Reed and she knows this for a fact that even if I do my best, things might not work out here which is very practical of her. And we get a few instances in this chapter of her, her uh, uh, practicality as, you know, cause we're getting to know a new character in a sense cause she's eight years older. She's 18 now than we had, than she was, you know, um, uh, not long before. It's just the last two chapters when she's finally grown up. 
Yeah, another thing that comes to my mind here, I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Sound of Music. I, I'm thinking about the I Have Which is a very Jane Eyre story. The governess. The governess yeah. turning up and yeah. she's a captain with seven children. What's so fearsome about that? That fear word is here. The kind of, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to, uh, and it won't always be enough, but I've got confidence and I'm going to do it. This feels like the 19th century equivalent of Maria singing that confidence song. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if my wife's watching the show. We got we got married at Aldi Mansion in Doylestown, PA, and that was the the first place that the Von Trapp singers went to to sing in America when they came wow. after the war. So there you go. That's my sound. I hope music you had a musical there. tribute then. <laughs> That's my. We we played Eric Wolfgang Korngold music for our wedding. So from from swashbuckler films, um, the. Uh, uh, she arrives at Thornfield at this drive. There's a pair of gates. I love that we pass through and they clash to behind us. Who the heck closed the gates? Was there someone on the gates? Because we don't get to mention there's many people living in here. Um, right. And I recently read later book, uh, but The Haunting of Hill House, which maybe people yes. are reading um, inspired by the recent Netflix inspired series um, and the gates there and the entering of the gates. And once they close behind you, there's no getting out. Um, again, a later Gothic, but all of those tropes here. And, and what I noticed is that in The Haunting of Hill House, um, she has a great first night's sleep as well, just like Jane. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Home. Interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't read that in a few years now. What a great book. I'm actually watching the Netflix series right now. I put it off for a long time and I'm finally watching it. So Very well. um, um, the uh, um, but but these kind of I, I feel like this gothic atmosphere hits too. the gates and they clash behind him, the candlelight in one window, all the rest was dark. And then she comes in and that's everything's not just illuminated, but there's, it's a cozy and agreeable picture presented itself to my view. And we'll have this a few times in this chapter is what you just mentioned too. this, this kind of, it, there's this Gothic atmosphere and then she turns it around right away and it says, and then everything's like this, but that kind of almost illuminates, I think the Gothic atmosphere that she's talking about because you see the contrast. Yeah. She meets Mrs. Fairfax, um, the neatest imaginable little elderly lady in a widow's cap, black silk gown, snowy muslin apron, uh, exactly what I had fancied Mrs. Fairfax, only less slightly, less stately and milder looking, the cat at her feet, the beau ideal of domestic comfort. Uh, it was a reassuring introduction for a new governess. Um, I almost see her as this is still the young Jane here imagining, you know, these the, the storybook that that she's going off into that that you're right. Oh, she's not an adult yet. She's not she's not become fully an adult yet, whatever that means. Yeah. The um, other thing for me here is this is one of the moments where I see a possible intertextual reference with Agnes Gray, because when Agnes arrives at both of her two positions, she has a terrible greeting for a governess where on one of those occasions, the mistress of the house doesn't even meet her. Um, she's just met by servants, given very little food and shown up to her bed. It's a few days before um, the mistress of the house will even talk to her about the children. So I almost see here is that Charlotte's giving us the opposite of Anne. Anne yeah. gave that very hostile, treated like one of the staff, where she gives us this moment of who she believes is the lady of the house, having the condescension to sit with her to treat her kindly and warmly and of course later we find she's not the mistress of the house um but uh, yeah i just I, I think about the bronte sisters round that table writing together reading each other's work to each other and i mm -hmm. wonder if agnes gray is in the back of charlotte's head here i often think charlotte too is as as a writer likes to take these personal experiences of her life and when she can make them turn out the way she wished she could they could have turned out <laughs> And Anne is like, oh, no, 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 no. It's going to be worse <laughs> before, it, before it gets better. Um, isn't it so interesting when um, Mrs. Fairfax is speaking about Leia and John and his wife, decent people, but then you see they are only servants. A and later, of course, we learn that she's the housekeeper. But I yeah. think 
is a great piece of us understanding the nuances of Victorian society that mm -hmm. a housekeeper and a governess are not servants in the same way that John and his wife and Leia are, but yeah. they're not full members of the household either. And of course, we'll see that later with how Jane relates to the neighbors who come, Blanche Ingram, how she's treated, mm -hmm. is she a servant or not? And then, of course, there's that level of comfort here when she finds that um, Mrs. Fairfax is actually in that same liminal space. Um, but yes, no. they are only servants. Um, it's that kind of thing of when you see the internalized misogyny, it's similar here, like the classism that even a housekeeper has um, towards the servants not being fit companions for her. We're an hour in and we hit the word liminal. We almost said it earlier. I almost said it earlier. Mm -hmm. I always wonder how long it's going to take to get to the word liminal. Um, which is, uh, it seems to be the favorite word of everyone these days talking about books and, and experiences in books. And it's so all over this book anyway, it's hard to not to do it. Um, but that kind of in-between space. And, and I like, especially as it will happen later in this, is that, is that we really get highlight. Some people understand, some people would treat a governess and a housekeeper very respectfully. And some people like the, plant, the people that will come in later are just so dismissive and awful about this. Um, but Mrs. Fairfax, Jane thinks she is the, the you know, the lady of the house here. Um, uh, and uh, she, uh, she has Leia offer her a little hot negus and a sandwich or two. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mrs. Fairfax. Um, and uh, she says, uh, Jane thinks she treats me like a visitor. I little expected such a reception. Of course, she doesn't realize she's the housekeeper and Perhaps she would have gotten a different reception from a, a, another kind of, you know, uh, uh, matron of a house. So, um, and Mrs. Fairfax is so glad she has come. It'll be quite pleasant living here now with a companion, um, she calls her. And I, you know, I can just almost imagine, you know, I, I, I like like the like the like the squee coming out of of Jane like this is what she wants that she's going to come and a, a, to be a companion to someone a friend a, someone amiable agreeable um, uh, as as you know uh, she says uh, my wish my sincere wish that she might find my company as agreeable as she anticipated this is what she's been waiting for oh and I, I didn't talk about the agreeable agreeable is eight times in the novel and there's actually three disagreeables and um uh but but, but she's far more the idea of using agreeable meaning like to someone's liking pleasing to a person or to his or her taste um uh and it's that old it's old french ah plus gris and the gris was a uh, favor or goodwill, an old French word. So it's that having favor or goodwill of somebody originally, but it is make, and, and, and it's fascinating the way it's used in this. I'm sorry, now I'm gonna go off a little bit. It's oh. early in the novel, she, she, it's used, it's um, uh, Abbott, the, the other servant at um, Gateshead, who's the, the nasty one, tells Jane, she has to make yourself agreeable to them, meaning the Reed family, which is, which for Jane would be very, a, a very negative sense that, oh, I don't want to be agreeable in that sense. Um, and then it is later, it is your place to be humble. Oh, oh, the full, the full, the full, the, the full expression. She says, it is your place to be humble and to try to make yourself agreeable to them. Um, Helen says about Miss Temple, her language is singularly agreeable to me. And she doesn't just mean like, it's she's saying things that I agree with. She's saying that it's, you know, that, you know, liking and pleasing and uh, is all wrapped up in that. Um, and the the Thornfield parlor earlier in this chapter, it was a cozy and agreeable picture presented itself to my view. Um, and, uh, or is that here? Um, no, that was a little earlier. And then, um, uh, and then, oh no, then this one, I expressed my sincere wish that she might find my uh, company agreeable. And the disagreeable is interesting because uh, a benefactress when Jane is told that Mrs. Reed is her benefactress when she's a child she's like a benefactress is a disagreeable thing um, and, uh, and Helen is accused of being a dirty disagreeable girl I think Miss Scatchard um, who's, who's nasty um, who fits her name that's a very Dickensian name she has um, so uh, this idea of agreeableness and, and disagreeableness is 
is throughout this novel and both amiable and agreeable are both words that are about a wish for a connection with someone or not having a certain connection with other people, which is what not, not, not only what I think Jane wants, but what other characters tell her, she, like Helen notices that in her, you want to be loved. Um, you want people to love you. She says more, more, more specifically. Um, I guess from the first 10 chapters, we might have a question of, well, is Jane agreeable? Right. Like she, it's a sincere wish she has here that she's agreeable. But we've seen her as the little girl who's not happy in her position as a dependent, who's kind of uh, ready to be right, quite radical um, to push for something else. And I, say, I think that while there's a little bit of the wish fulfillment here and what a lovely greeting and what an opening she's already wanting more, like when she wants more information about Rochester, like her curiosity about the more gothic parts of the house, like when she asks, well, are there any ghosts here? She's kind of seeking out um, the more dramatic. Mm -hmm. and, and this could just be a story about a, a governess who knows her place and sits um, in the cozy little room with Mrs. Fairfax, drinking negus with the cat at their feet. But Jane is a more disruptive force in the household than that. She is disruptive in the way she talks to Rochester, which will come in later chapters, right? She doesn't know her place. Is she really agreeable? And I'm very interested in questions about the likability yeah. of these characters. I said that up with Lydia Robinson. I would argue that some of her commentary on Adele that's coming up later in this chapter is quite harsh um, in the way that she thinks of the child, even if her outer actions are, are quite kind. Um, and we know that within Jane, there is this passion, the same passion that had her beat her cousin over the head as a small little girl. And so I think what we're waiting for is the kind of gothic impending doom of the house, but we're also waiting for that explosion from within that we know is deep in Jane's psyche from several of the incidences in the early part of the novel. I love that idea of, 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 of that she's disruptive and she is disagreeable and maybe that's not such a bad thing. Um, right. Certainly as, certainly as modern readers. And, and I, and I love there's a tension earlier in this novel between whether or not for us as a tension in that the way we look at it and say like, yeah, Jane, go for it. And, but, but, but she couldn't possibly be thinking that, or Charlotte Brontë could possibly think that it's always a good thing to be so disruptive. But clearly, yes, to be, uh, you know, <laughs> to be uh, at least a bit, if not, you know, more than a bit disruptive is a good thing. Yeah. And of course, there's the difference between what she says and what she thinks, right? Mm -hmm. Even here, she doesn't express that she's tired and wants to go to bed until Mrs. Fairfax gives her that opening. So she's being polite but how genuine is it? And I would say that when we get to the Adele portions later here, there's sometimes an absence of access to the thoughts there where we can only imagine that Jane's thoughts are a little bit harsher than the ones we're being given on the page. Yeah. Well, right now she is happy to be agreeable and happy that Mrs. Fairfax is so agreeable mm -hmm. and she's shown to her new room and we go through the Again, there's this kind of gothic atmosphere that the house looks like a church and the chill and vault-like air, the cheerless ideas of space and solitude. But then she gets to this very nice little snug modern style room, it's called. And then I love this paragraph here. Would you read this? When Mrs. Fairfax bidden me had bidden me? Yeah. When Mrs. Fairfax had bidden me a kind good night and I'd fastened my door, gazed leisurely round, and in some measure effaced the eerie impression made by that wide hall, that dark and spacious staircase, and that long cold gallery by the livelier aspect of my little room. I remembered that after a day of bodily fatigue and mental anxiety, I was now at last in a safe haven. The impulse of gratitude swelled my heart, and I knelt down at the bedside and offered up thanks where thanks were due, not forgetting ere I rose to implore aid on my further path and the power of meriting the kindness which seemed so frankly offered me before it was earned. My couch, had no, my couch had no thorns in it that night, my solitary room no fears. At once weary and content, I slept soon and soundly. When I awoke, it was broad day. A safe haven, she thinks she's found, even though she keeps seeing these, you know, kind of gothic, you know, elements to this place and... Um... But, but she is, and she talks about when she was at Lowood, she'd have to imagine all kinds of 
you know, agreeable, fantastic things in order to fall asleep. Um, you know, her, her, uh, barmicide feast, she would have to imagine. And, um, uh, here she sleeps soundly and that, and of course the great pun, right? My couch had no thorns in it that night. She's yeah. a thorn field, everybody. Um, right. Uh, and then the other thing I'd call out that night, she could have just said, my couch had no thorns in it. My soul is here, yeah. but it's that night. And so we know that those thorns and those fears are coming. This is the Gothic promise to the readers of just hold tight. There's something going on in this house that's going to be a little bit more interesting than Mrs. Fairfax and her cat. Um, I love that. The Gothic promise. I'm going to, I'm going to use that phrase again. Thank you. Um, uh, that's definitely there. Um, and then she wakes up and um it's there there's well there's a lot of promise but but it's then it's a little measured response now read this next paragraph here if you would yeah yeah okay the chamber looked such a bright little place to me as the sun shone in between the gay blue chintz window curtains showing papered walls and a carpeted floor so unlike the bare planks and stained plaster of low wood that my spirits rose at their view externals have a great effect on the young i thought that a fairer era of life was beginning for me one that was to have its flowers and pleasures as well as its thorns and toils. My faculties roused by the change of scene, the new field offered to hope seemed all astir. I cannot precisely define what they expected, but it was something pleasant, not perhaps that day or that month, but at an indefinite future period. So there's now there may be, now right? there may be thorns, right? Now there may be. Um, oh yes, as she knows that they will come. But I think it's like she doesn't even know what those flowers and pleasures that she's hoping for could be. Um, right. She said so little, like when she said, oh, she greets me like a visitor. I was like, well, how does Jane even know how visitors are treated? Has she ever seen anything nice? And I, I did see someone yeah. in the chat said, has anyone ever been pleased to see Jane Hare? Yeah. Well, not really up to this point in her existence. <laughs> Miss Temple was the only one at first. And yeah. then, uh, um, but we even have some people in our audience who aren't happy with Miss Temple. Um, but yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I, she, I bet there's and, and the indefinite future period. She recognizes that she's heading off into this, you know, new life here, um, and uh, and then she dresses herself, and then we have this all this language about her appearance and how she looks, and this is a really kind of thorny, you know, uh, the, for lack of a better term, way to to that we have to deal with now this is very much a victorian mindset and i think i think modern readers see this very differently um uh but she dressed herself with care simplicity she solicits to be neat that's fine but it is it's when she talks about how she regrets she was not handsome uh, handsomer um and uh, uh and that she wishes she was more beautiful um i think a modern response to this is much different than a response that not just Jane would give, but Charlotte Bronte would give and many people in the 19th century would give. Um, uh, and it's also a very, it's also Charlotte Bronte really pushing against um, the, the expectations of a novel here too. And her heroine is going to be plain uh, and know that she's plain and not beautiful. Um, yes, and it's also one of those things where we're, she's not telling us what she looks like. She's telling us what she doesn't look like. So she doesn't have rosy cheeks. She doesn't have a straight nose. She doesn't have a small cherry mouth. She's not tall. She's not stately. She's not finely developed in figure. She is little pale and has irregular and marked features. But we get more of what she's not than what she is. And yeah. I think this, um, this becomes pretty standard in a lot of fiction with a female protagonist of it focuses on the insecurities and the lacks, but it doesn't give you many of the details of what she is so many people can kind of see themselves in Jane's place like irregular features she doesn't specify their exact irregularity so if you're a person who doesn't like your own mouth or your own eyes or your own eyebrows you can start projecting that in and imagining Jane as you and that's a lot of kind of in YA fiction we talk about having that character who's a stand-in for the female teenage reader and maybe not sketch her appearance not given to us in detail so that many teenage girls can imagine themselves in this spot and I think that's very true of the depiction of Jane here yeah uh -huh. Bella Swan someone saying in Twilight very similar yeah and of course we know that Twilight you know has that Bronte connection Wuthering Heights um yeah. in there 
you mentioned I, I, for readers and you mentioned specifically i think young adult readers identifying with characters and this is something that i that i find so true with 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 my kids and and just with the reading audience is that people far i find that younger readers nowadays and i wonder if you do too absolutely want to identify with characters and i always felt that i, I that was not that important and I didn't know if that was just a thing that is more developing more now, or if that is still my kind of privileged male position that I never had to worry about identifying my character because they were all white males that pretty much I was reading anyway. Um, yeah, I think that's a age category thing as well for me. Yeah. Um, so I think if you look at children's literature, right, like it goes from the the little picture books that are teaching you things about the world, like what an apple is or that the caterpillar is hungry and therefore grows bigger. Um, but once you start to get to some more sophisticated literature, it gets to the point of like, oh, imagining yourself in a story, in an adventure, putting yourself in the world and that identification becomes more and more important. Mm -hmm. I, I think that in fiction for adults, that's less important because it's more about entering the mind of somebody else. Um, having empathy for people in other positions, maybe reading about people very different from you and their identity or yeah. worldview. Um, and then I would say this is where the genre kind of comes into play that in romance fiction in particular, some level of identification is quite desirable. Like if you're reading romance fiction in order to be titillated, in order to fantasize yourself, in order to imagine what it would be like you being in a relationship with Rochester, it becomes more important to be able to put yourself in Jane's shoes and to imagine mm -hmm. yourself as being like her. So I feel like um, in romance, maybe some of that identification is important if people yeah. are using this as um, essentially a, a, some form of erotic or fantasizing literature. Um, I, I did want to bring up as well, so I know it skips us over another page, but I just wanted to compare Jane's description of her own features to what she says about Adele on the page over. Um, I looked at my pupil who did not at first appear to notice me. She was quite a child, perhaps seven or eight years old, slightly built with a pale, small featured face and a redundancy of hair falling in curls to her waist. So what's interesting to me here is there are some similarities with Jane herself. Jane is also little and Adele is small. She's pale and she has just said her own paleness mm -hmm. is bad, but the hair is very different. Like curls okay. falling to the waist is, sounds very beautiful, very attention grabbing, but that word, a redundancy of hair, this is the kind of harshness in her description of Adele that I guess makes me question Jane's likability. Yeah. Um, because who looks at a child with beautiful long hair and thinks, well, that's too much hair. She doesn't need all that. It's almost except, like she's going to grab the scissors yeah. and cut it off. <laughs> except for Mr. Brocklehurst. That's who would. <laughs> Brocklehurst yes, exactly. would order that hair to be cut off. And Jane, in a sense, sees that too. That's very interesting. Right. And, that's, and, and rather than having empathy or sympathy for her about like, oh, we share things. We're small. We're dependent. We're living in a household that's not our own. And as I said, is Jane a child? I would argue yes, in some way she still is. What well, she's only 10 years older than Adele here, but instead she immediately focuses, I would say with a slightly envious edge on the hair that Adele has that she doesn't have. And of course, yeah. as the chapter goes on, we see some of the coquetry that Adele has, the confidence, the almost more womanly aspect that this child has versus Jane who is totally has no experience um, with the world of gentlemen that Adele has been exposed to from, from infancy. Mm -hmm. Jenny has another question here. And uh, she says about regretting, you know, being beautiful. Why had I these aspirations and these regrets? Now, hey, in a novel, especially when you keep saying reader, reader, you're asking me this question. And then she says, I could not then distinctly say it to myself, yet I had a reason and a logical, natural reason too. Now, without giving away something later in the novel, I can, does she does she directly answer this question later, or is this something that she wants us to ponder and figure out on our own? I can't remember. I think it's so interesting. I can reason a logical, natural reason. Yeah, like what is your logic? Is it her I mean, upbringing at Lowood and and before that Gateshead that she's been taught that she's not supposed to be beautiful because she's inferior to everyone? 
I mean, for me, the logical reason is that it's a commodity for her to improve her position in the world, which is very much how Lydia Robinson in my novel thinks about it. Like she criticizes her daughters for eating too much, for not looking after their complexion. The more attractive they can make themselves to men, the more chance they have a happiness. So for me, that's the logical reason is if she was more beautiful, people would like her more. She'd have more prospects. She could get married. Um, the natural reason, I think, is even more subversive because the natural reason starts to hint towards sexuality for me. It's the natural impulse to be beautiful, to be desired, to be wanted. And, and one thing I think is interesting is that the night before when she's praying, she's doing all the good things. She's praying to God, thanking him, showing suitable gratitude, asking for strength. But by the morning, um, she's much more focused on these kind of frail, frivolous things that she shouldn't be thinking about as a Christian woman, like mm -hmm. how beautiful she desires to be. And yes, that word natural for me starts to kind of bring in the idea of desire and yeah. the natural impulse to have a mate. Yeah. And she's and she's taking, you know, she's she's proud of her neatness and her yes. simplicity. And it's the the, uh, the the natural I'm becoming a woman is threatening to her especially you know uh in the way she was brought up and especially at lowood so right. even though lowood improved for those last you know eight years it's still you know uh she certainly uh, i i don't think has that you know um maybe too modern impression of a of a woman to be very self-expressive and, and and especially um uh sexually so yes i mean she's not just wishing for a symmetrical face here she wants to be finally developed in figure right like yeah. she wants a hot body she wants to stand out in the <laughs> world um and she's saying oh well there was a logical reason and a natural reason um but she's still ashamed of those desires yeah. and it feels like she needs to excuse herself for them she goes out to look at the house from the outside in the daytime, which which I like. And, and we see it's this, you know, house battlements and there's a rookery. Um, uh, the um, uh, and there's an Arabella visits. So, <laughs> yes, this is Arabella named for the character in Jude the Obscure. There you go. Um, she uh, uh, she sees why Thornfield is named for the array of mighty old thorn trees, strong, knotty, and broad as oaks outside. Um, and uh, Mrs. Fairfax comes out. And this is where she finally learns that Mrs. Fairfax isn't the you know, owner of the house. Uh, she's just the housekeeper, uh, the manager. She calls herself, I'm only the housekeeper, the manager, distantly related to the Rochester's. So at least you know, connected in some way. So that really, that also puts her in another position. Like I'm clearly not just a servant. I'm even related to the family. But I mean, Jane was related to the Reeds and what good did yeah. that give her? Yeah. So I think it again shows the similarity in their positions. I did just want to mention that Mrs. Fairfax gave her an affable kiss. So affable Oh yeah, I had that in my notes too. <laughs> yes. What a, what a great way to be greeted for, uh, for Jane. Uh, to, to have that, you know, to have her give her an affable kiss and shake of the hand. So, and also the notice too, that when she's looking out at the hills around um, uh, that uh, uh, she says the lonely hills uh, seeming to embrace Thornfield. And when she was at Lowood and looked out at the hills, she says, here was the hilly horizon. My eyes passed all, all other objects to rest on the re most remote, the blue peaks. It was those I longed to surmount all within their boundary of rock and heath seem prison ground exile limits. So the hills made her feel like this is a prison. I'd love to, you know, like there are ways to escape, but here it's an embrace that, it, that this is a much different place where she's living. Um, yes, but still again, back to that Gothic promise of she's still pretty trapped. This is the middle of nowhere. The gates close behind yep. her and it's surrounded by mountains and the wilderness. So even if she's feeling good about it right now, um, as readers, we might have that question of, can she get out? Like, I know that a few pages back, she said, oh, you know, if it's bad, I can just advertise again for another situation. But there's still a feeling that she is kind of locked in here. She finds out that Rochester, she finds out that Mr. Rochester owns the place and Adele is his ward. That's who she's going to be taken care of, um, that she's a foreigner, that Adele was born on the continent. Um, and then we meet Adele. She comes out and uh, Jane says her name is Air, Jane Eyre. And Adele says, Air? Ah, I cannot say it. Um, yes, I mean, it's hard to read that 
Air Jane Air without thinking Bond, James Bond. So I did <laughs> have a little Bond moment there. Very good. I hadn't thought that. That's great. Now I'm always going to think that. Um, um, the And then she meets Adele and she is just... Um, kind of the most precocious to annoying um kind of you know for at least a modern sensibility doing your little song singing an opera our <laughs> little yeah, candidate so an opera for me is so interesting because this description of adele we don't we don't get many of those really obvious thought sentences where it's like jane telling us what she was thinking she kind of doesn't tell us what she was thinking but what she was thinking must be what we're thinking which is what is the relationship to Rochester? Is he this girl's father? Is her mother some sort of prostitute or kept woman? Yeah. Like these are the natural questions in our mind, but Jane doesn't put that on the page. Now, some of that I think is Charlotte censorship in that, you know, she can't get away with saying some of these things on the page in this book. But some of this seems to be Jane as a character kind of not giving us access to her meanest thoughts about Adele. So it creeps through in just the way it's written. So an example here, a great many gentlemen and ladies came to see Mama. The fact that she puts gentlemen first before the ladies, we're like, oh, who is your Mama that she's entertaining so many gentlemen? The fact that Adele puts herself on Jane's lap in order to sing is already an inappropriate, like, oh, was she going and sitting on all these gentlemen's laps and all these ladies, even as a seven, eight year old, that kind of behavior is held up to us as a little bit suspect. Um, and then of course the point of the exhibition. So saying that she is kind of exhibiting herself um, mm -hmm. in a way that Jane, who's so Quaker-like would never do. And, and then I mentioned the um, the Holy Virgin thing, the kind of Catholicism here, like Jane can't even bring herself to say it. She says, but after your mama went to the Holy Virgin, as you say, she is not going to agree that when her mother died, she went to the Holy Virgin. Uh, one, because she thinks that her mother is suspect for some of the things that Adele's saying, but two, because that has a Catholic ring to it, which this puritanical Jane Eyre um, does not enjoy. And then of course, when Adele says she and that Rochester gave her pretty dresses and toys that kind of puts her in the same class of woman as her mother yeah. who was receiving get, gifts from all these gentlemen. Um, so I, I just thought this was like a, a fascinating in like what she doesn't say. And it's like the mean girl sort of description is creeping into the language, even while she's not like overtly cruel. And then when she says, I found her sufficiently docile, we've just seen her as a little girl being anything but docile and rejecting the idea that she has to be docile. And she imme immediately projects that um, onto little Adele. So mm -hmm. this for me is where we see, and I know she changes over the course of the novel and she does develop a relationship with Adele. We know that she has just gone through this very significant experience at Lowood and a very restrictive childhood, but there's a lot within her that I would say naturally rejects and rebels against what she sees in Adele and it has that same envious tinge to it that we see in her reaction to her redundancy of hair thank you that's fabulous I you know that that's that that question is overhanging this you know whole exchange in this chapter is who is it like well Mr. Rochester's relationship and that doesn't go away uh, he has an explanation for it later that I'm not even sure readers entirely buy um, yes. And then the other part of this is interesting. So Mrs. Fairfax is the one who asks Jane to ask her questions about par her parents. She says, um, I wish, continued the good lady, you would ask her a question or two about her parents. I wonder if she remembers them. But then while we get what Adele says, we don't know how much of this Jane translated for Mrs. Fairfax. How much is she explaining? How much is she saying verbatim what Adele's telling her? And how much is she withholding this information and keeping it to herself? I'd be fascinated by that about like, is she telling Mrs. Fairfax that Adele's mother entertained lots of gentlemen and ladies and that she was singing opera for them and putting on an exhibition? Or is she kind of in that role of translator choosing what to obfuscate? Yeah, I agree. Um, that's great reading, uh, close reading. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a couple things to hit before we end. Um, uh, especially, uh, well, I, I hate to skip over the Holy Virgin. 
um, <laughs> that yeah. that Adele mentions and and ask because because this is a this is a point that I think you've yeah. you've noticed in this this you know reference to religion and um uh, and and you you you're I'm sure well aware of of Charlotte Bronte's just out and out disdain for Catholicism that you can see in her own letters and then especially in their first version of Villette, the Pro- the professor. Um, uh, how does that play out in this novel? Because she's, is, what does this mean that, what does it say to the reader that, um, uh, that Adele mentions the Holy Virgin and signifying herself as Catholic? Hmm. Well, I think it's interesting in relationship to, we've just had a reference to Quakers and how Jane is dressed as a Quaker. So it's another point of difference between her and Adele. And I see someone in the comments here is talking about she's comparing her childhoods with Adele's. And I think we as readers naturally must be doing that. We're like, how different from Lowood, this little girl was having pretty dresses and toys and hanging out with adults and singing songs, which is the opposite than the very Protestant upbringing um, that Jane has received with all its harshness at, um, at Lowood. So I think that's playing out. There's a kind of the femininity that comes through of her talking about the Holy Virgin versus Jane always praying directly to God. I also think is interesting though, in that she's summoning like a higher female power with that kind of natural fertility, right? Like the Virgin mm-hmm. and the, but the Virgin mother, all of that is in here. Whereas Jane's God is sexless and not of the flesh, which is why I was saying it's interesting the night before she does the good praying to God, but by the morning she's wishing that she was beautiful and had a finely developed figure. And I do think that even in Villette, we have, yes, there's disdain for Catholicism, but there's also almost like a fear of how in the body it is, how potentially sexualized it is, um, you know, how intimate it is in the confessional booth um, when she's talking to the priest in Villette. So I think there's like something that draws her to elements of Catholicism and Catholic countries and the continent, even while she's simultaneously repelled, um, which I think plays out here. And I could almost see if Jane was a man, like Rochester, she might be off in Paris dabbling with some of this um, attractive um, continental way of working. Um, But as a woman, of course, she's cut off from doing that. Um, So, yeah, I would love to keep close reading over the next few chapters to see any specific lines that stand out. But for me, she's simultaneously repelled by Adele, but also fascinated by her Mm -hmm. Uh, and jealous of her and wishing that she could um, kind of play up her femininity in all of these ways. And then when she goes to teach her, it's it's very nice that that she really considers Adele's abilities. and, And so she doesn't come in with this you know, way of like, no, this is what you have to learn. And you have, she doesn't force her into learning anything in any particular way. And um, she recognizes that she's, you know, that she hasn't really applied herself to much learning and she needs, she needs room to grow and, and move about. And um, so she only gives her a short lesson that first day. Yes. Um, I have a question, like, does she underestimate Adele or she doesn't esteem her very highly? Like even when she's talking about the French and she's saying how good her French was, she's like, I was not likely to be much at a loss with Mademoiselle Adela. Like she doesn't know at that point how extensive this little girl's vocabulary is, how smart she is, how much she knows, but she's already like, oh, don't worry. I'm not going to have any problems with her. Um, So there is that kind of writing women off for being attractive, Mm -hmm. which is something I see through the work of Charlotte Bronte, right? And that's something I play with in Bronte's Mistress of Lydia Robinson is rich and wealthy and sexually experienced, which is, the opposite of a lot of Bronte heroines who are poor and plain and young and virginal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's like the, not like the other girls is the kind of modern way of putting this, that Jane thinks she's better than Adele and by extension, women like her mother uh, and assumes that if she is conventionally attractive, then she mustn't be very intelligent. And so I'd say, yes, there's two ways to read that short lesson. Is it that she's being a kind and responsible teacher and taking a measure of her before she gives her anything hard? Or is it that she's already restricting Adele and, and kind of perpetrating some of these misogynistic ideas that she's surrounded by? Yeah. Like even when she talks about the books, she's like, oh yes, like that's all we could possibly need to teach her and not the books locked up behind glass. But that's, when does she say that? She says kind of, she hints that it would have been good for herself um, if she could have had access to the other books. Yeah. So she says, 
And I suppose he had considered that these were all the governess would require for her private perusal. And indeed they contented me amply for the present. But there's this idea that in the future, she might want to go beyond this level of learning. And that's something mm -hmm. she keeps very much for herself and not for Adele. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's gone this, you know, eight, you know, we've, we've done, you know, nine, 10 chapters of her on the other end of this. And now you know, as the young, as the child to the, to the, you know, adults around her. And now this is her first experiences. Well, not her first, because she had been teaching at Lowood. We just didn't read about her experiences with her students at Lowood. Um, this is the first time we see her in the position of, of teaching a child and how she's going to treat her. And uh, Jane will have to learn Adele, just as other people had to learn her, as she was such a difficult child, disruptive in a good way for me. Um, she sees more of the house here. And then there's two things I want to hit here. One is the questioning of Mrs. Fairfax about Rochester. Is he an exacting, fastidious sort of man? Do you like him? Is he generally liked? I mean, questions that, that Mrs. Fairfax doesn't seem like she doesn't consider his character or uh, you know kind of you know uh, on, on any kind of intimate or personal level um even when jane says do you like him she says yes the family is respected <laughs> right so uh, this is where i think we see the distance between charlotte and jane again and jane's yeah. youth i think this is an inappropriate line of questioning yeah. i think that jane in the position that she's in now she didn't know coming here that she would be a governess in the household of a single man and she's just found that out. So the last thing she should be doing is showing sp a special interest in a single man. And Mrs. Fairfax keeps pulling it back to like, she asks about him, her answer is about the family. It's kind of like she's gently correcting Jane about the right way to behave in a workplace. And Jane is just totally missing the social cues. And Charlotte, I think is very aware of that and is writing it that way. And this is where I think we see Jane aspiring to more. Right. Like she's not she says that she's happy that Mrs. Fairfax and her are at the same level in the same position, but she's not. She wants something more, just like she wants the finely formed figure and the regular face. She wants to know what the real wealthy people, the real upper classes are like people who are higher in station than her. And just as she was not happy to be seen as a dependent to the reeds, she's not going to be happy in just this position as governess. She wants the books that are locked up behind glass. She wants to converse with Mr. Rochester and understand his character and the life that Mrs. Fairfax has of just kind of being demure and um, allowing her betters to exist without her is not one that Jane's going to follow. Um, so I think it's very clear from this, I think, quite funny conversation where she's pushing her for more and more and more. She wants to know the secrets. She wants to know what's, you know, locked up behind, you know, closed doors. And, and we get a hint of that then here at the end as they go exploring the ad. Now, why Mrs. Fairfax would even take her up there? It's like, come on, Mrs. Fairfax. You're just asking for trouble. Um, but she shows her the, the attics. And then they even talk about ghosts. Um, uh, there's no ghosts here. Um, and she's disappointed, right? She says there's no ghosts. And then she's like, nor any traditions of one, no legends. Like she's pushing. She's like, really, not anything. Like, why doesn't she want to be comfortable? Why doesn't she want to be happy? She's pushing for something that's going to bring a little bit more of that fleshy excitement to her life. And, and I think that will be coming. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Grace Poole's laugh. And I, I did want to call out... Um, was as tragic as preternatural, um, right? Like beyond the natural. And we did just have, um, yeah. she has a natural reason for wanting to be beautiful, but this is beyond nature, this laugh that she hears. in the well, Before we get to that, they, they go out in the roof first and everything's beautiful. I love this line when they come back in, because she says she makes her way down the ladder and she says, the attic seemed black as a vault compared with the arch of blue air to which I had been looking up. And it's more of this Gothic language. Now she's suddenly in a vault. She even compares the corridor in some Bluebeard's castle. Um, you don't want to go to Bluebeard's castle. <laughs> I mean, I would say that's a little heavy handed on the foreshadowing for me. I think a yeah. modern editor would take that right out. You're giving away <laughs> what's going to come later. Like, Bluebeard is such a 19th century reference. They bring him up all the time. And I, yeah, I think that's a little clumsily done. If I was Charlotte's editor, I might take that one out. <laughs> well, it's there. And then as she, she hears a laugh struck my ear, a curious laugh, distinct, formal, mirthless. 
Um, read that part, why I pace softly on. Just read that right. little bit. While I pace softly on, the last sound I expected to hear in so still a region, a laugh struck my ear. It was a curious laugh, distinct, formal, mirthless. I stopped. The sound ceased only for an instant. It began again louder, for at first, though distinct, it was very low. It passed off in a clamorous peal that seemed to wake an echo in every lonely chamber, though it originated but in one, and I could have pointed out the door whence the accents issued. So there's her ghost, right? That's her mystery. <laughs> that's she the got, yeah, that, 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 that's what she was asking for, please. Um, what is this, you know, laugh going on? And, uh, but she gets a very ordinary answer yeah. um, from Mrs. Fairfax that it's, you know, it's, uh, it must be Grace Pool. Um, and, uh, and, and Grace Pool comes out, a woman of between 30 and 40, a set square made figure red haired with a hard plain face any apparition less romantic or less ghostly could scarcely be conceived yeah. uh, um, mrs fairfax says too much noise grace remember directions so which we will find out what those are later right and then again this is the third woman whose appearance has been described or the fourth woman in this chapter right we've had jane's own appearance we've had mrs fairfax we've had adele's and now we have grace pools and so those words we would associate more with ghosts, like the paleness, I'd say that Jane is the most ghostly um, figure in the house appearance wise of the ones who've been described here. Uh, Grace is very much of the earth, earthy um, and, you know, solid square set heart, yeah. um, even if she's plain like Jane. We've a, one of our, uh, 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 one of our co-hosts described Jane as haunting her own novel. She's haunting her own Gothic novel. Right. Um, and uh, she is uh, now going to haunt Thornfield um, uh, too. So, um, and that's it. They, and Mrs. Uh, Fairfax obviously turned, the conversation thus turned. She starts talking about something else because she doesn't want to talk about Grace Poole and what this laughter could be. And uh, they go away to eat and the chapter ends. So. Um, yeah, I'd say it's not the most compelling chapter ending. Um, it's one of those, um, we found dinner ready and waiting for us in Mrs. Fairfax's room. It's the kind of moment you could set down a book. Um, but she's given us so many things in the chapter before that she's seated. Who is this Mr. Rochester? What is his character like? What is this strange laugh? What is the story of Adele and her relationship to Rochester? So this chapter has raised a lot of questions. Yeah. So she doesn't need to do the cheap thing of raising a question with the last line, like that cliffhanger, because she knows she's got you and we're going to keep reading. Absolutely. Um, we have to give away a book before we go. Yeah. And um, uh, we, we also had some unanswered questions here. Uh, I, I'll see if I can't get some answers out to you guys. Um, but let's go with uh, my, my randomizer. What I'm doing is I pulled out the participants and I'm, my eyes are literally closed right now. Well, they will be in a second. And I'm going to scroll up and down and then finger on my screen, somebody here. And it is Barbara Roman. Barbara Roman watching, you have won a book and I will contact you as you're registered for the Zoom. I can send you an email and we can send this book to you. Write your name down here. Congratulations. Congrats, Barbara. And I can, I can customize the signature. So when we get in touch, we'll ask, who should I make it out to? If it's a gift for someone else or for you, let me know. But I hope you enjoy the book. Great. We'll do that. No, what are you working on next? Are you allowed uh, to talk about it? <laughs> I can't tell you too much, sadly. I, I will say it's not bro directly Bronte related, though I always um, want to stay in this Bronte community now that I found it through Bronte's Mistress. Um, there is a 19th century link, but it's not entirely in the 19th century. Um, and again, I think a theme for me is going to be the true stories of women who we've maybe forgotten um, or didn't know existed, but led interesting lives. Um, so that's all I can say for now, but hopefully I'll have more to tell you soon. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, Bronte stores and airheads. Thank you all for tuning in today. We'll post this recording on our website. And if that's how you're watching, Hey, thanks for watching. 
Uh, we have a Sundays with Jane Eyre Facebook group where we continue the conversation. Look us up on Facebook and join in that conversation. Also go to the Rosenbach's YouTube account, like the Jane Eyre videos, subscribe to the channel, leave comments, do all that stuff. Uh, that helps us out considerably. I want to thank our chat, Mrs. Fairfax today, Brianna, for managing the links in the chat today. Thank you. Um, next week, we'll have the always welcome return of the ghoul guides, uh, Dr. Lauren Nixon and Mary Going. Did you see, you saw the episode with them, didn't you? Did you? Yeah, no, yeah, you awesome. Okay, good. Yeah, they're really great. Uh, we'll be covering chapters 12 and 13 uh, and with the arrival of Edward Rochester and we also get a glimpse of what Jane has been up to with her painting. I love that painting thing or descriptions of her painting. If you're looking for more virtual engagement, everyone head on over to the Rosenbach website, check out the other virtual offerings we have. Also the Rosenbach is open to visit, see our website for how we're making it safe for you to come and see our exhibitions and historic house in person. We have some couple great courses that are starting very soon. I would highly recommend you sign up for one of those. Uh, and please support the Rosenbach, which you can do by donation. Uh, $18.47 is what we're recommending, but any, any donation is welcome. Uh, and if you're not already a member, I invite you to join as well. Finola, thank you. No, thank you. This was awesome, and I'm definitely going to keep tuning in. I just wish we could have all of these Airheads and Bronte fans in one place to celebrate um, the end of this great series. Yeah, well, maybe next spring we will uh, get to do that. Would be nice. We were hoping we were going to end the last couple series. I was hoping like we'll end with a live audience and it just could never uh, materialize. But as we're going to April 10, uh, maybe that'll happen. And you will be quite welcome to come back on the show if you want to come back and do another one of these Thank chapters. You. I can um, hop on Amtrak and I'm seeing requests for the cat. So um, <laughs> there you go. There's Arabella. Yes. The pets of Zoom. We've, no we've come to know so many of them. Everyone uh, playing us out over the credits will be Pleated Gazelle's Secrets, a uh, song written for the show. Uh, thank you, Pleated Gazelle. Thank you, Tucker, Christine, and Pleated Gazelle for make, creating that. And everyone, farewell, readers. May you live entirely for and with what you love best on earth. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching today. Thank you, Finola, so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.